In this video, we are going to talk about protobuffers. If you don't know what protobuffers are, think of language agnostic data structures that you can compile. Let me explain this with a concrete use case. Assume that you have a data producer written in Python and a data consumer written in Go. Also, you have a lot of data that needs to be transferred from the producer to the consumer. How would you solve that problem with the knowledge you have so far? Well, one option is to convert the data into some open format like CSV or JSON, transfer the data, read it in, and then process it. The problem with this approach is that it is rather inefficient since you have an encoding and a decoding phase that takes quite some time. Also, the format might not be super efficient since it is text-based. Another option would be to create a byte representation of the class or struct, send it over the wire, and then use that one in the next process. For that, you could, for example, use Pickle and Python. The problem with that approach is that it only works within one language and you might also be limited to the same version of Python and packages that you use. With protobuffers, we get the best of both worlds. It was developed by Google to power its transfer and processing of massive amounts of data. You start with a generic definition of messages. Those messages hold data just like structs and you compile those messages to classes or structs to a language of your choice. For transferring data, the data gets encoded into a very efficient byte representation, which you can use to load instances of messages that were defined in the generic definition file. To explain this, we'll have another use case. Let's assume that we are the owners or that we work for the owners of a few casinos on the Las Vegas Strip. We have acquired some new technology that automatically sends the result of a game round to a data streaming hub. However, to make this transfer of data efficient, the data is encoded in protobuffers. Obviously, there is a data producer, and we are going to write that one in Python. Then there is a streaming data hub where the data gets sent to, and for this we will use the Google Cloud service PubSub. And lastly, there needs to be a data consumer, which we are going to write in Go. Since the data will be protobuffer messages, we also have to define those messages. Let us start with the definition of these protobuffer messages. But first, we need to create a new project. Actually, there are three components in there, Python, Go, and protobuffer. I'm going to create three folders in there. So first we create the project. So mkdir, and I'm going to call this one Vegas. I'm going in there. So we're going to create the folders go, Python, and proto. So mkdir, go, Python, and proto. Let's go into the proto folder. We are now inside the proto folder and can start writing the message definitions. I pretty much just need one simple file for the messages that we want. So I'm just going to call this one games.proto. This will hold the relevant data for the game results for our casinos. So let us create that file now. So let us create a file called games.proto. The first thing that you would want to add is what version of protobuffer we are actually using. You do this by creating a variable called syntax and set that to either proto2 or proto3. I'm going to use proto3. Notice that the statements in the proto file should end with a semicolon. Also for Go, I declare what package the resulting code belongs to. So let's start with the general stuff. So general options, the syntax is proto3 and the package we're going to call Vegas. Now some Go specifics. And I want this to go into a protobuf Vegas PB. So notice that protobuffer uses the same comment style as Go. You can see that I structure my code into two separate sections. The first one contains some basic configurations. As mentioned, I declare that I want to use the proto3 syntax. Also, I say that this belongs to a package called Vegas. Then I also add a Go-specific option, so the compiler will put the code into a folder called protobuf, then Vegas PB, and then a file called vegas underscore pb dot go. The package will be set to Vegas PB. Later, I will move this into an internal package in my Go code. Okay, let's create our first message. I want to have one called result that simply has the summary information on the game that was played. This should include the net return, which can either be negative, zero, or positive. As the casino, we obviously want this to be positive. Also, we get the runtime in seconds and the number of players involved. So let's create some messages. And the message that we want, so we say message 
is game value. And that one has that one has a few fields. Turn underscore value. Runtime and place. Okay, so what am I doing here? We start by declaring that this is a message and we call the message game value. Then we open a pair of curly braces, a bit like we define structs. Then inside the curly braces, I declare fields by first putting in the data type of the field and then the name. This all seems reasonable, but then you see an equal sign and an integer. What am I doing here is that I assign a field number to every field. With new versions of the proto file, you can add new fields or retire existing fields. However, it is important that you never reuse the field numbers else you run into trouble with updates to your messages since fields are identified by their numbers. Imagine that you set a field called name to one and then in the next version, one represents something like age. If two processes are using different versions of your proto file, they can't really communicate with each other. However, if we know that one always stands for the return value, even if two processes are running on different versions of our proto file, they can still communicate safely with each other. And on the other hand, if you just don't reuse field numbers, you can just add new fields. If your upstream process uses an earlier version of your messages, you can just ignore the new fields. If you delete a field, you must reserve the number in your message. Have a look at the protobuffer documentation on how to do that. Great, let's also assume that the system we acquired has some computer vision system built into it and it gives us a probability of foul play in the game. For this, I will create a message called foul play with only one field that indicates the probability of foul play predicted by a proprietary model. So we create a new message. And I'll call this one foul play. It has exactly one field, which is a float. It's called probability. Okay, now one last message that puts everything together and adds some metadata. However, for the actual game that was played, I want to use a predetermined list of allowed values. For this, I will create an enum. Also, I will nest our previously created messages in this new master message. So first, let's create an enum. And I'm going to call this one game. One for slots. One for poker. Then one for blackjack. And one for roulette. So we are not creating a message this time. Instead, we are creating an enum for possible games that can be played. Our casinos offer slots, poker tables, blackjack, and roulette. Also, we have a value for unknown games. However, we don't expect values for that one. Okay, next we create a message for a game event. This will be the data that we are going to stream and process. So let's go all the way to the end. and Let's create one new message called game event. First one is a string and it's gonna be an ID. Then we have game and a string, which is the ID table device. And actually let me scroll down a bit. Then a game value, which I'm gonna call value and a foul play, which I'm gonna call foul underscore detection. Obviously, we want a unique ID for an event. So if you look at this, this is our unique ID. For this, I declare a field called ID event that is a string and set this to the first field. The field will be used for deduplication. The game field is simply another message in our message. ID table device is a unique ID from where the measurement was taken. This can either be a cards or roulette table or an electronic device like a slot machine. Finally, you can also find fields for the previously defined message, game value, and for play. Okay, that is all. It is now time to compile our code and use the resulting types. Remember that I want to build a data producer and a data consumer. For the producer, I will use Python. Although in reality, the producer of the embedded software will probably code this in C++ or Java. 
I won't code this in Go since I want to show you that we don't need to care about what language the producer was actually using. The data that we get is the same. We will always be able to create Go structs from the binary data. So ironically, this video will contain mostly Python code. Okay, so let's save this, exit, and then compile our code. For this, we first need to install the protobuffer compiler protoc. Also, I make sure to delete every installation that I might have on my local machine. So first I'm gonna say sudo rm rf, I wanna remove user local protoc. Then I need to put in my password. You probably don't have to do this since you won't have the compiler installed on your machine anyways. So to install the compiler, we will go to the protobuffer GitHub repo and go into the releases page. That one is located under github.com, protocol buffers, protobuff. Go to releases and select the latest version. You can see that there are zip files for all the major operating systems. I'm using Linux, so I'm going to copy the link for the 64-bit Linux version. Great, with the link in our memory, we can start downloading it. I'm going back into my terminal, download the file, and then unzip it. So I'm using wget, put on the link, and I'm going to save this in my downloads folder. And I'm going to unzip this. Into user local protoc. And if we would now check the content of user local protoc, there you have it. Also, I want to install the necessary package for Go. So I'm going to say go install google.golang.org protobuf command proto c dash gen dash go at latest. Also, I want to make sure to add the bin folder of our newly created proto c folder to my path. For this, I open my dot profile file and add the respective entry. So I'm going to open the one in my personal folder and it's the dot profile file. And you want to make sure that you have a line that looks like that one. So you can see that I already did that when I set up my system. This way I can use the protoc binary that resides in that folder. Normally I would restart my terminal for the changes to take effect. However, since I added this a while ago, this already took effect. So just make sure that you add a line called export path equals dollar sign path colon user local protoc bin. So let's test that everything works as expected by running the protoc program. So protoc and I'm gonna use dash dash version. There you go. So this looks good we can now compile the messages that we have to find earlier. For this, we head into the folder containing our .proto file. And actually, we're already in there. So here I will create a build folder for resulting Python and Go code. I will instruct the proto C compiler to put the resulting code into these folders. So first, we're gonna create those folders. So mkdir, gonna create one called build Python and one called build Go. Uh, there, there it is. Let's actually have a look into the build folder as well. Yeah, go in Python. Then we're going to run the proto C compiler or the proto compiler. We say Python dash dash Python underscore out is equal to, well, build Python. And for go out, we say it should go into build go. And we want to compile the GameStar Proto file. Oops, uh, seems like there's an error in that file. Expected identifier. Okay, let's have a look. Yep, actually, this does not take quotation marks. So let's go back and let's rerun this. That's done. So we invoke the program by using Proto C. Afterwards, I set a path for where to save the resulting Python library and where to save the resulting Go package. Note that you specify folders since we might compile multiple proto files with different packages at once. Then I pointed to what files, in our case just one, I want to compile. So what does this actually return? For that, we cd into the dist folder and have a look at what actually gets created. First, I'll check the Go code. So cd and then we go into build go protobuf Vegas PB because that's what we set as the package. Then let's list the content. 
And there you can see one file called games.pb.go. So let's actually have a look what is in that file, games.pb.go. And you can see that this is Go code. It declares a package, creates some variables, functions, and most importantly, creates structs. You don't have to worry about the nature of this code. We just have to import the structs that we've created from the messages that we have defined inside the proto file. Next on, let's look at the Python code. So for this, we need to go a few steps back into the Python folder. And you can see there's one file called games underscore pb2.py. And we also have a look at this file. The location is a bit simpler since we create Python packages by locating them at specific paths in our project. Looking at the code, although, this is absolutely not simple. I have quite a few years of experience in Python and except for the imports, I have no idea what's actually happening here. But that does not need to worry us since we are able to simply import the messages we have defined earlier as classes from this internal Python module. With our protobuffer code in place, let's copy that over into our project and I start with the Go code. So for that, I'm going to create an internal folder to which I simply copy the build go protobuf folder. So let's go back into the main folder. So into the Vegas folder, then I'm going to create a folder called go and one called internal. And then what I do is I simply copy over what we have in the proto folder. Ah, sorry, proto, then into the, go into build, go, protobuf, I take this entire folder, everything that's in there, and I copy that over into go internal. Cool. We now have the generated protobuffer code in our Go project. Now we have to do the same for Python. This will be a simple auxiliary process for which I'm not going to create a whole lot of stuff. I will basically just start a script that generates some random data on the producer's side. Hence, I'll just copy the file into the Python folder. So I'm going to copy, I'm just going to the proto, build Python, and I just take that file that is in there, and I just put this into the Python folder. With the Python code in the correct place as well, we can start writing some code. I think it makes sense to start with the producer side, so I will actually start out with writing some Python code. I will start with an internal functions.py file in which I create functions that will be used in another script to generate the data. So let's go into the Python folder. And if you don't know any Python, that's fine. If you don't understand the ins and out of this code, you can treat this like a black box. In our example, we said that we bought some system from a vendor and it will, would be in reality, it would be proprietary anyways. So you can just treat this like a black box basically. So the first thing I do is to make some imports. I will use scipy to generate random data from statistical distributions. From scipy.stats, I import the ones that I assume I will need. Also, I will import the built-in random library. Also, you wanna pip install scipy if you don't already have it on your machine like so. So you can install it with python-m pip install scipy. So I'm not doing that because I already have that on my system. So let's create a file called functions and we make some imports. So um, maybe I wanna import some internal stuff, I don't know. Um, some built-ins. I always like to have like these three categories in here. So import random, I know that I'm gonna need that built-in random package or library. Then some third-party stuff. And this is going to be scipy. So from scipy dot stats, I want to import norm, lock norm, and Bernoulli. As you can see, I'm importing the normal distribution, the lock normal distribution, and the Bernoulli distribution. Okay, so first thing we're going to write is a random draw for the available games. That is easy. I will simply supply a probability to every available game and then pick one game at random. So. So let's define some functions. And the first one we're going to define is get a random game. And I'm going to call this one get game. And it simply returns a string. So first thing, we're going to define some probabilities. So here are the games that are available. Let's say slot, poker, blackjack, and roulette. And we have some probabilities. 40% for slots, 10% for poker, 20% for blackjack, and 30% for roulette. Then we pick a random game. So the game that we choose going to use the random library 
I'm going to pick, make a random pick from games. The weights are the probabilities. And I want exactly one draw. And then I return the result. So I'm going to return the first result of that game list. Because it makes multiple choices, but we just set it to one. So basically, this function is a wrapper around the choices function inside the random module. It takes a list of possible values, a list of associated probabilities, and the number of samples that you would like to draw. I merely encode the population and the associated probabilities inside the function and then sample a single data point. That data point then gets returned to the caller. It would now make sense to create a function to simulate a single game value. For this, we need to return three things. A return, a runtime, and the number of players. As input, it will take the game name, since there are some differences for the different games in terms of average, return, etc. For example, it doesn't make sense to have more than one player for slot machines, right? So let's create a new function and get random. We do this to get a random. So I'm going to call this one get value, and as input, it takes a string. And first, we're going to draw return from normal distribution. So distribution I want to I want to draw a random return and actually get, get some space and let's create some probabilities for the different games so for slot I say the mean return is let's say two dollars standard deviation is five dollars then for poker let's just say the mean is ten dollars uh, the standard deviation is $20. Then for blackjack, the mean return is $4. And the standard deviation, let's say, is $10. And we have one more, which is roulette, where the mean return is also $4. And the standard deviation is also $10. OK, now we need to sample. So we get a sample return, or random return actually. So, and we're gonna sample this from the normal distribution. So we wanna get a random value, and the mean is, the mean of that normal distribution is, well, we just take the mapping return, take whatever game we, we gave it, and then we just take the mean value from there. The standard deviation, we also take from this dictionary that we have created before. And then, last but not least, we also need a size. So how many random samples do you want to take from there? Well, just one. So just give me the first element of whatever is the result of this. Then we also want to draw a random runtime. So I need a probability mapping for that one as well. And for slot, let's say that the mean runtime is let's say 10 seconds because that is quite fast but there's also standard deviation and for poker well poker games are pretty long so let's say 500 seconds with a standard deviation of 120 seconds for blackjack well those games are a bit shorter 120 seconds with a standard deviation of 80 seconds and for roulette, uh, let's say also 120 seconds, but only 30 seconds standard deviation. All right, then we're gonna draw a random sample from not the normal distribution, but this time I'm taking the log normal distribution. And gonna take some shape values for that one and just take one for the mean let's take mapping runtime well we take whatever we defined for the game or we, whatever we provided as the game then we take the mean value then for the standard deviation same as before take whatever game we defined and then take the standard deviation and then we only want one sample and again, we just take the very first element of that list because it returns a list. Okay, one more. We wanna draw a random number of players. And this is going to be 
bit simpler. So mapping players. So how many players are there max? So for slot machines, there will always only be one player. For poker games, there can, let's say, be up to six. For blackjack, let's say our tables are a bit smaller, only five. And for roulette, well, there we can fit up to 12 people onto a roulette table. For this one, I am simply going to create a set of choices, which is everything from one to however many players are allowed on a single table or for a single game. So one to whatever the maximum range is. And then I just sample from that range. So I make a random choice from choices players. So every, every single number has the same probability. And then in the end, we need to return a result. And remember that we want to return three things. We want to return the sample return. So that's the sample return value. We want to return the runtime. And we want to return the number of players. So, okay, that, now that is quite a lengthy function, but what I'm basically doing here is drawing a whole bunch of values from either a normal distribution for the returns or from a log normal distribution for the runtime. For the number of players, I merely specify the maximum number of participants in every game, and then I get a random sample between one and that number. So we also need to simulate the probability of foul play. Obviously, most games won't be tampered with, but I want just a few cases with a considerable amount of foul play probability. First, I get either true or false from a Bernoulli trial, and then I will choose either a high or a low random value for the probability. So let's add one more function. And we're gonna call this one get random foul play probability. And we'll call that function get underscore foul play. And it just returns a float takes no input. Okay, so first thing that I want to do is I want to check whether there was full play. So let's just check whether there was full play or not. So we take the Bernoulli distribution, we do a random sample from it, and the probability of full play is actually 0.005. So it's a half a percentage. And I want to take exactly one sample draw and just take the first element and then get a random probability. So I say, if there was foul play, then the probability should be, well, we take something from the normal distribution where the mean of the normal distribution is 0.8 and the standard deviation is 0.1. So this will give me a fairly high value and I want exactly one random sample and I just take the first element. So, uh, and I should say foul, not fault, uh, again. So, so if there is full play, then we sample the random probability from a normal distribution where the mean is 0.8 and the standard deviation is 0.1. So this will give me somewhat a high value for that one. But if there's no full play, then the probability will be, well, it's never going to be exactly zero, right? So we also sample from a normal distribution, but the mean of that normal distribution is 0.05 and the standard deviation is 0.02. And we just want one random draw from there. And I just take the very first element of the result. Now, one more thing that I gotta do, I gotta limit the result to be between zero and one. So if the probability is less than zero. Well, what I'm going to do is I want to just set this equal to 0.01. And if the probability is greater than one, I want to set the probability equal to 0.99. Then in the end, just got to return the result. So return the probe. Lastly, I need a function that generates an ID for a table or slot machine. I will just assume that they have some logical ordering that goes by casino-type-number. So one more function, but first I need some space and I'm gonna call this function, actually let's put a comment first. So get random table ID. I'm gonna call this one get table ID. And as input it takes a game, which is a string and it returns a single string. So first thing, I want to find the available casinos. 
because we have multiple casinos. And I'm going to create a map for that. So mapping casino. Casino. And so let's say the first casino that we own is the underscore grand. I'm just going to make up some casino names. And that casino has a probability of being drawn off 50%. So this is our largest casino. And it has the following number of tables. It has 550 slot machines. It has 15 poker tables. It has quite a number of blackjack tables, so 35. It has 20 roulette tables. And we're gonna choose the next one. So this one's gonna be a smaller casino. So I'm gonna call this, let's say, a little mountain. And the probability of that one being sampled is 10%. It's a small one. And the tables that are available, oh, sorry, I just realized, let's make this tables. So tables that are available, let's say it has 100 slot machines, well, it's a smaller casino, it has two poker tables, it has 10 blackjack tables, and it only has five roulette tables. Then let's take make a let's take another one, which is the emerald. Let's say this is a this this casino is a bit larger, so the probability of being sampled is 30%. And the tables that it has are 30 slot machines, 10 poker tables, 20 blackjack tables, and for roulette we have uh, 15. Also, the thing is called Emerald. And let's do one more, and we just call it the Shore. Maybe it's like a Hawaiian theme casino, I don't know. It's just 10%. Number of tables that it has, number of slot machines, fairly low, let's say 60. The number of poker tables, let's say three. The number of blackjack tables, let's say 13, and the number of roulette tables, let's say 5. Okay, so first thing, I want to draw a random casino. Because remember, we set some probabilities. So the choices that we have are, well, uh, we can just take the keys of the casino dict, casino dictionary. So we take the keys there. The probabilities, well, we can just go ahead and take those proba values. And I do this in a list comprehension. And then I'm going to make my final sample. So the casino that we actually take is, well, random.choices. Well, we have the choices defined as the names of the casinos and the weights are the probabilities, so the probas. And I want to take exactly one sample, so I'll just take the first element of that resulting list. So we've drawn the random casino, but that's not all. Now we need to draw a random table. We already know the game because remember, like one of the inputs to that function was actually the game. So we just need to know how many tables there are. So the maximum number of the table that we have is we just go into that mapping of the casino, take the casino that we sampled, then take a look at the tables and we take whatever game that we uh, gave it when we were calling the function. So let me get some space and the table that we want. Well, we're just going to make a random choice but in the range of one and whatever the maximum number of tables is that we have. Actually, let's add one to that one. All right, so we've drawn a random table number. Now let's create the table name. So the idea of the table is going to be, well, the name of the casino, dash the name of the game, dash the name of the table. So I'm going to format this. And the first one is going to be casino.lower. I want to make everything lowercase. Then we take the name of the game, make that lowercase. 
and just you know take the table all right last but not least we need to return the table id so i am returning id underscore table all right so let's go back so inside the dictionary I define four casinos. Every casino has a probability since one casino is bigger or smaller than the other. Also, for every casino, I define how many tables we have for every game. I then draw a random casino based on these probabilities and one of the available table numbers. In the end, I then concatenate the casino name, the game and the table number. With that, we should now have the functions we need to create some random data. So for the next step, let us create a function that will create a game event. Inside the upcoming main function, I want to create game events and send them to the data streaming hub. First, I create a function called createEvent that returns a populated game event message class. For that to work, we also need the classes created from our proto file as well as the built-in UUID and time libraries. So let's import those. So first thing, something from internal. So I'm going to import games underscore pb2 and I'm just going to call this pb. Then from the built-ins, I need UUID and I need the time library. Okay, now let's define that function that we talked about and let's get some space for that one. So we want to create a random game event. So we're going to call this function create event. And what it returns is a game event. Okay, so the first thing we do is we need an ID. For that one, I'll just create a unique ID by using the UUID, UUID4 dot, and I want a hex value. Oh, sorry, actually gotta call this one and then get the hex value. Then I wanna sample some random values. Remember that we defined the functions, but you know, nothing ran until that time. So give me a random game. So I say game is equal to get underscore game. So I've now gotten a random game. Then I want to get a random game value, or actually random values. So the value, the runtime, and the players, because remember, it returns two, three things, actually. So get underscore value, and as input, we give it the game. Then we need a full play detection probability. And I'm going to call this one probo foul, foul. And we use get underscore Foul play. Doesn't take any arguments. And we need a table ID. So ID table is equal to get table ID. And we give it the game that we just sampled. And now this is going to be a bit tricky. So we need to get the value for the game. So the one from the enum. So we say match the game variable. So the, the game that we randomly sampled. If it's slot then set game to pb dot, sorry, game underscore slot. If it is blackjack, well then set game to pb dot game underscore blackjack. If it is poker, well what I wanna do is, I wanna set game to pb dot game underscore poker. And if it is roulette, well, I want to set game to pb dot game underscore roulette. If nothing of that matches, so for the default case, we just set game to pb dot, remember we had this unknown game or this unknown value for the enum, so we just set it to that one. So we start by creating a unique ID for our event using the UUID module. Afterwards, we use the functions that we have defined previously. Remember that we have defined enums for the available games inside the proto file. Our game variable is merely a string. What I do here is that I match the game variable and set the variable to the respective constant as defined in the compiled classes from the proto file. Great, so we now have all the data ready to create the actual game event that was compiled from the proto file. So, so let's create the game event. So game event equals pb dot game game event then we're going to set some values so game event dot id underscore event well that one is equal to the id that we just created then we take the game well that one is equal to 
whatever value we just matched before, so equals to game, game event dot id underscore table underscore device. That one is equal to id table, game event value dot return value. So the return value is, well, whatever we just sampled. Then we have game event dot value dot runtime is equal to the runtime that we have sampled. Then we have the game game and with the game event dot value and of course we also need to set how many players participated in that game which we have also sampled so players and then last but not least game event dot foul underscore detection dot probability that was equal to the probar underscore foul which we have also sampled and then in the end we need to return the result. So we return game event. So the way this works is by first initializing an instance of the game event and then set its fields directly by just assigning values for its attributes. Notice the nested structure where some fields are messages as well. I just enter the nested structure by just using these periods. Also, while Python is a dynamically typed language, the values provided must at least be convertible to what you lay out in the proto file. With this function in place, we can start creating our main function where we actually run the code. So inside the main function, I simply start an infinite while loop, sleep for a random amount of milliseconds, and then create a message. Remember that the whole point of protobuffers is to be able to share data in an efficient binary format that also works on other programming languages. For this, we will have to serialize the game event. At this stage, I will simply print the serialized message to the screen. But if we get back an interesting result, we will start streaming them into Google Cloud Pops Up. So let's exit this and let's create a new file called main.py. So I'm going to make some imports again, some internal ones, and I'm going to import functions as F. I'm going to import games, games underscore pb2 as pb. Then I need some built ins. So I'm importing random and I'm importing time because I want to sleep for a random time. And maybe some third party, I don't know yet, uh, at least not at this stage, but later on. So let's define a main function first. So def main. The first thing we do is we enter the while loop. So while true, so this is gonna be an infinite while loop. First thing we do is, well, we're just gonna sleep for random amount of time. So the amount of sleep that we wanna do is random, and we sample from a uniform distribution, uniform between 1.01 seconds and 0.5 seconds. So then we sleep for that amount. And then I'm going to create a random event. So event underscore pb. So this is going to be a game event. So we go into the function. So f dot create underscore event. Doesn't take any arguments. And now I need to serialize event to a byte string. So event bytes. So we take event underscore pb dot. And then we say serialize to string. It's, it's gonna return bytes, but it's a byte string. So serialize to string is the method we're gonna use. And then all what we do is we just print those bytes, event.bytes. Uh, actually, let's run this. So if we run this as a script, so if the name is underscore, m underscore main or dunder main dunder, then we actually run this main function. Okay, let's save this. So it's time to run this and see whether we get a whole bunch of messages printed to the screen. So I'm going to say print dash dev and I wanna run main.py and notice that I have a special development environment that I use for Python. That is why I'm using Python dash dev instead of the systems Python. So if you don't have it, um, you can just use Python. Okay, let's run this. All right, let's cancel this. Okay, so this looks like we got it right. We have a whole bunch of messages that get printed to the screen. 
So let's prepare everything so we can stream those events into PubSub. For that, we have to navigate back into Google Cloud and create a PubSub service. So in Google Cloud, just navigate back to all products. And under analytics, you will find PubSub. The first thing that we do is create a topic. I'm going to call this topic Vegas. So let's click on create topic and I'm going to call this one Vegas. Also, we will need a way to read the messages that are being published into this topic. Hence, I will set up a default subscription. So let's create that topic. Okay, now we want to send the bytes representing the game event to PubSub. Before that, make sure that you have the Google dash cloud dash PubSub library installed for your Python distribution like that. So let's go back into my journal. So you can say Python dash M pip install Google dash cloud dash PubSub. I have this already installed on my machine, so I'm not going to run this. So having this installed on our machine, we can now head back into the main function and simply replace the printing of the message by streaming that into PubSub. However, for that, I will first have to create a publisher and then stream the data using that publisher. So let's go back into the main function. And now I'm going to import a third-party library. So from google.cloud import pubsub underscore v1. Then we go into the main function. Now I'm going to change this a bit. So we read in environment variables. So I want to have the configuration written from environment variables. So project is going to be whatever is set as project in the environment variables. And for the topic, I'm doing the same, but I'm taking the environment variable topic. Then we need to create a publisher. So the publisher is pubsub underscore v1 dot publisher client. I'm going to create an empty one and then need to define the name of the topic. And I'm doing some string formatting here. So it's projects forward slash, whatever the name of the project is, forward slash, topics, whatever the name, forward slash, and then whatever the name of the topic is. Okay, and then we go into the while loop. Well, we sleep for a random amount of time. That is fine. We create a random event. That is fine. Then we serialize event to byte string. That is fine as well. But then we also need to push this to PubSub. So this creates a future and we use the publisher for that one. And we use the publish method. And as input, we give it the path to the topic or the name of the topic. So forward slash projects, name of the project, forward slash topics, forward slash name of the topic. All right, so, and this is encoded in name topic. And the second argument is the actual bytes that we want to send. Well, for that one, we're going to send the event underscore bytes. So since I want to save the project and topic name as environment variables on whatever machine is running this code, I will also need to import the OS library, of course. So import OS. And I want to stream to PubSub. Hence, I also import the PubSub version one module from the Google Cloud library. Afterwards, I define a main function wherein I first read in the project and topic environment variables. We also need a publisher. So I start by initializing one, which is empty. Whenever we want to stream data into PubSub, we need to give it the location of our topic. For this, I do some string formatting and I save the path to the topic inside the variable called name underscore topic. Now, we enter the infinite loop where I first sleep for a random amount of time, somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5 seconds. Once the sleep is done, we create a random event. We then serialize the event to a byte string and this byte string can be streamed to PubSub since PubSub literally takes bytes for messages. For this, I use the publisher's publish method, give it the path to the topic and the byte string for the event. Notice that this returns a future. Hence, this runs asynchronously. Since this is just a simple toy example, I will merely fire and forget. I won't even do anything with that future. This goes on until somebody stops the data creation process that is running. Obviously, we now want to test that out. So let's create a bash script that sets the respective environment variables and then we run the main function. So let's go back. Let's create a bash script called set underscore env.sh and I'm gonna export project. So the project environment variable is going to be go for data engineers 
And then we set the environment variable topic, which is Vegas. So you can see that I set the project environment variable for go for data engineers, which is the name of our project. The topic is set to Vegas, which is also the name of the topic that we have created inside the Google Cloud pops up service earlier. So let's exit. All right, and with this in place, we could now theoretically start the streaming of data into pops up. However, at this point in time, it would not make a lot of sense since we don't have anything reading from pops up. Remember that when we created the pops up topic on Google Cloud, we also created a default subscription. We can use this subscription to read the messages. This is what our Go program will do. We're going to write a program that will read the raw bytes from PubSub and create instances of structs. We could then do whatever we want with that data. We could do some further data processing with it, or we could save the data into BigQuery, for example. At this point, I merely want to print the struct to the screen so that you see we can go from Python classes to Go structs easily. For this, we head into the Go section of our project and initialize a Go project. Load the Google Cloud pops up and the protobuffer dependencies. So let's go back into the Go folder. And we say Go mod in it because we now need to create a Go project. And I'm going to use my GitHub handle for that one. And I'm going to call this one Vegas. And I'm going to say Go mod tidy just as instructed. And I'm going to install those dependencies. So go get cloud dot google dot com forward slash go forward slash pops up and i'm going to install google dot golang dot org forward slash protobuf so before i actually read in messages from pops up i would like to define a callback function that gets applied for every incoming message this is necessary since we will have to supply a callback function to the receiver for this i create a new internal package called streaming Inside that callback function, I expect the message data to be a byte string containing the data for a protobuffer message. More specifically, I expect this to be the bytes for the game event message. In my callback function, I would like to create a struct for the game event from that byte. We start by printing a simple log entry containing the information encoded in that struct. So let's create a new directory inside the internal folder and we're going to call this one streaming. And then I'm going to create a file in there, internal streaming streaming.go okay let's start by declaring a package so the package is streaming then we do some imports so i'm going to import the context library format library then from the external ones i get cloud.google.com forward slash go forward slash pub sub and i need google dot golang.org, protobuf, and in there I need the proto package. Also some internal stuff, so github.com, Vegas, and then we go into the internal folder, then to the protobuf folder, and from there I would like to get the Vegas PB package. All right, that's enough for the imports for now. Then we need to define our receiver callback function. I'm just going to call this function callback. It takes two arguments, a context and a pointer to a pops up message. All right, let's implement that function. So the first thing I do is and I'm going to explain what I'm doing. Yes, I acknowledge the message. So I have received the message, I worked on it. So I'm going to do this in a deferred call. Then I'm going to unmarshal the bytes into a struct. And for that to work, the first thing we need to do is, well, we got to create an empty struct. So it's going to be Vegas PB dot, and I said that it should be a game event. Let's actually initialize that one. And now I want to fill it with data. So I say error equals proto, the one that we just imported. I'm going to use the unmarshal function. I'm going to give it two things. I'm going to give it the data from that message and I'm going to supply a pointer to where that data should be saved in. And it should be saved in that game event variable. All right, if that thing throws an error, so if the error is not nil, what I want to do is, well, I'm just going to print a error to the screen. So saying error and whatever that says. 
and then I want to print the results to the screen. And first I'm going to define a string template saying event colon, then comes a string, then a semicolon, a table colon, another string, semicolon, game colon, another string, then return colon, then a two decimal float colon, and this is getting, we're getting out of space here. So let's concatenate those strings. So then we say runtime colon a two decimal float semicolon players a digit semicolon and full play. And for that one, I would like to have four decimals. All right, and a line break. Okay, let me just check. So event, table, game, return, runtime, players, full play. All right. Now when you want to print something, so I'm going to print to the screen, well, this template. And I'm going to fill this template. So the first string that I'm going to put in, well, I'm going to take the game event. I'm just going to take the ID event, which is a string. Then the next one should be the table ID. So I say game event dot ID table device. Then I want to fill the the game name. So I say game event dot game. Now we want to fill the return value. So this is game event. And now remember this is nested. So we say game event dot value dot return value. Then we want to fill the runtime. And again, this is nested. It's in game event and it's inside of the value message. And there it is the field runtime. Next, we're going to fill the number of players. Again, it lives inside of the value message and there it is in the field runtime. Okay, next one, we're going to fill the fault play variable. So this is also nested. Remember that in the game event, there was a message or a field called fault detection detection and that one was a message and there was a field in there called probability. We're going to use that one. All right. And that's the and that's the callback function. Okay, let's save this. So you are already familiar with the context and format package. As third-party dependencies, we load the pubs up and the protobuffer packages from Google. Also, I'm going to load in my internal protobuffer messages. Then we call the callback function, well, callback, and it takes exactly two arguments, a context and the pointer to a pubsub message. Inside the callback function, I start with some odd looking deferred call to message.ack. What I'm doing here is using the acknowledge method of the message. What this does is send a signal to pubsub that this message has been processed. Hence, no other consumer will receive this message for further processing. Afterwards, I create an empty instance of the game event struct. After that, I unmarshal the bytes into that struct, just like we did when parsing JSON files. In the end, I prepare a log entry for all the different fields inside that struct and print that struct to the screen. And that's it for now. So let us actually create a main function, stream in some data, and then use our callback function on that. So let's actually save this. Then we're gonna create a main.go file. And we're going to start by declaring the package. So the package is main. Then we do some imports. So we import context. I need that one again. I need OS. I need cloud.google.com forward slash go forward slash pops up. And I need my internal stuff. So GitHub, I'm using my GitHub handle here. And it's the, the package is called Vegas. Then we go into the internal folder and we take the streaming package. All right, time to define the main function. So the main function, is it what it does? So let's read in the environment variables. So I want to read in the project and I get this from the environment variable project. I want to get the subscription. 
and I get this from the environment variable subscription. Now let's validate those environment variables. So let's just make sure that those are set. So if the project is an empty string or the subscription is an empty string, well, I'm gonna say environment variables set wrong. So next on, we wanna create a context. I'm gonna say ctx is equal to context.background and then we create a pubsub client. So we say client comma error is equal to pubsub. So the package or the library we just imported and then we say new client. In this argument we give it our simple context and the name of our project, which we get from the environment variables. Now, if that throws an error, well, what we want to do is, we're gonna panic using that error. Then I want to create a receiver. So receiver is equal to client dot subscription. And we're gonna use that subscription name that we get from the environment variables. And then last but not least, we're gonna receive some data. So error equals receiver dot receive. Give it two arguments, a context, and most importantly, streaming dot callback, a callback function to use. And if there is an error, let's panic using that error. Okay, let's save. Oops, seems to be an error. Yep, it's nil. Save again, okay. So we import the context and OS built-in libraries. I will need a context in order to create a pub sub client. The OS library is needed to read in the relevant options from environment variables. Also, we load Google's pub sub library again, as well as our internal streaming package. The first thing we do in our main function is read in the respective project and subscription name from environment variables. Afterwards, I make sure that those environment variables were actually set correct, hence not equal to an empty string. If they are equal to an empty string, well, then we simply panic. Next on is the context for which I create a simple background context. Actually, in this case, it would have made sense to add a timeout since we probably want to stop reading messages after a certain time. However, I can also just stop the process using my keyboard. Then we create a client for pops up. This is fairly easy to do by using the new client function and providing a background and a project name. Notice that this is a client for the entire project, not just for our subscription. Hence, I create a receiver by using the subscription method on that client, providing the name of the subscription for which I want to load messages. Then, we start receiving data. For that, we use the receive method on our receiver and provide a context and most importantly, a callback function that takes a context and a proto message. Here we provide the callback function that we have defined inside the streaming package. Yes, in Go you can provide functions as function arguments. The receive method will keep running and for every incoming message, it will use the callback function. If this rolls an error, well, then we simply panic. And that's it. If we would run this and have the Python producer creating data at the same time, I would expect to see a continuous stream of data flowing in. For that, we first need to create a bash script that defines some environment variables, just like we did for our Python producer. So let's save this and exit. And let's create this bash script and also let's call it set underscore env.sh. And we're gonna say export and project is equal to go for data engineers. And also we're gonna set subscription equal to Vegas dash sub. Okay, let's save this. Okay, having set the environment variables, we could start producing some data and consume it at the same time. So make sure that you have two terminals open at the same time. We start running the producer on the left and have the consumer on the right. Okay, so again, on the left, I'm inside the Python folder inside the Vegas project, and on the right, I'm inside the Go folder on the Vegas project. The left, the Python one, that is my producer. The right, that's Go, that's my consumer. So actually when I wanted to run this, I got an error. So we gotta fix this real quick. So inside of our Go project, we go into the main function and you will notice that the error I did was this one. Forgot the colon. All right, while we are at it, we can also change one more thing that I just noticed. 
And if we go back into the internal package and into the streaming sub package, if we open that one, then you will see when we actually lock this event that everything is fine. So event goes to event, table, table, game, game, return, return value. Then we have runtime for runtime and players also takes the runtime. So instead of players, I said runtime, but obviously this one should be players at runtime. So let's actually change that and the full play is totally fine. So let's change that, save this. And now we're actually going to run this. So on the left, we have the producer. So this is our Python program and we can actually start that one. So let me first read in the environment variables. And then I say Python dash dev and I wanna run the producer. So this is now producing a whole bunch of data. And then on the right, I'm also reading in the environment variables and I say go run main. I will now see data flowing in. And there you go. We have a whole bunch of messages flowing in. Now we can obviously stop this, so we don't want to produce any unnecessary data garbage. So I'm going to shut down the producer on the left first. So the messages should stop flowing in once that one is shut down. So let's go to the producer. Let's actually shut this down by hitting control C. You see no more messages on the right. So let's actually shut down the consumer as well. All right, that is pretty cool. So we have now a streaming data pipeline in place. And in the next video, we're going to enhance and productionize this data pipeline further.